Good, well, let's read the passage for today. It's uh, all of chapter 20, but I'm going to start at the end of chapter 19, just the last few verses. Begin to read it, verse 45 of 19, and go into the first few verses of 21. Then he entered the temple area and began driving out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, My house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. One day as he was teaching the people in the temple courts and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the teachers of the law together with the elders came up to him. Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, they said. Who gave you this authority? He replied, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? They discussed among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us because they are persuaded that John was a prophet. So they answered, we don't know where it was from. Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. He went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and went away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, May this never be. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be honest, and they hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their duplicity and said to them, Show me a denarius whose portrait 
and inscription are on it. Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. Some of the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her and in the same way died, leaving no children. Finally the woman died too. And now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage and they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For to him all are alive. Some of the teachers of the law responded, Well said, teacher. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. Then Jesus said to them, How is it that they say the Christ is the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? While all the people were listening, Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of the teachers of the law. They like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted in the marketplace, and have the most important seats in the synagogues, and the places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for a show make lengthy prayers. Such men will be punished most severely. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts in the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had to live on. I've called this passage a war of words, and the moral is don't ever argue with the Lord. You will lose. Habakkuk the prophet is a classic case. He argued with God and got completely tied up by the Lord in reply. Now, in this war of words, as I've called it, we first have three attempts by other people to challenge Jesus, indeed to trap him, so that he said something that would get him into trouble. And then we turn from them to Jesus himself, who three times introduces a conversation to others. So we have three things said to him 
and three things said by him. And all this was during the last week of his life on earth in the temple where he was bound to be reported on to all the leaders of the nation. It was really sticking his neck out. And the first question they asked him was, by what authority do you do all these things? He had just cleansed the temple and single-handed cleared all the money changers out because, you see, there were Roman coins and Hebrew coins in circulation. And most people had some of both. And God's money was only allowed in the temple. And therefore they had to change their Roman money into Hebrew money to put money in the temple treasury. That's the background. Now he answered the question with a question in return. That's a very clever device if you're discussing anything. When somebody asks you a question, you ask them. Put the ball back in their court. And so Jesus said, I'll ask a question of you. By what authority did John the Baptist work? Was he authorized to do what he did by men or by heaven? And they dare not answer that question. Because if they said, well, heaven gave him authority, he will immediately ask us, why didn't you believe him? Because they certainly didn't. And if they said human authority, they were trapped in their own words. And so it was a very clever answer that he gave. And they refused to answer it. And so he said, then I refuse to answer your question. If you won't answer me, I can't answer you. But actually, he'd given them the answer. And the answer was, we both operated on the authority of heaven. God sent John the Baptist, my cousin, and heaven sent me too. So he had answered that question, and even more so, he then told them a parable which gave them an even further answer. So he wasn't avoiding giving an answer. And in the parable of the vineyard, he told them what they wanted to know. Because Israel was often seen as a vineyard, and the owner of the vineyard was God. And so he told them this parable which really accused them of killing the Son of God. Because he said the owner of the vineyard sent servants at the time of harvest because he expected some of the produce as rent. And each of the servants he sent was cruelly treated, killed, and sent home with nothing. So, Jesus said, the owner of the vineyard finally said, instead of the three servants I sent to collect the rent and they were badly treated, I'm going to send my loved son. Surely they'll respect him. And of course the answer was they didn't respect the son any more than the servants. And they said, if this is the son... We'll kill him and we'll inherit the vineyard. There'll be nobody else to inherit it, so it'll be ours. And Jesus was saying, God sent me to you, his vineyard, and you're planning to kill me already so that you can have the vineyard to yourselves. That was the answer to that question. God gave him authority to cleanse the temple of the money changes. Now he then quoted Psalm 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the capstone, the most important stone of all, which holds the arches together at the top. 
top stone. The builders won't have it, but he's become the most important stone of all. And anyone who falls over it will, will kill themselves. And anyone on whom the stone falls will be crushed. In other words, he's saying to the tenants, the one you've rejected will become the most important person in your life. By the way, in discussing all that Jesus was saying, we're discussing the one who will decide our future. And that's why your attitude to the stone the builders rejected to Jesus is going to decide whether you go to heaven or hell. And that's why we study the life of Jesus, to get to know the person who's going to decide our future. The next question he was asked was a real tricky question. What do you think about paying taxes to Caesar? And that was a red-hot question. If he said we shouldn't be doing that, they report him to Rome and he's in trouble. If he approves giving taxes to Caesar, his popularity with the people will just go to zero. A tricky question. And he asked for something. Our translations say he asked for a penny, but he asked for a denarius. That's a silver coin, a denarius, which is a day's wage then, and it has on it the face of the Roman Caesar. And he asked for a, one of these, and he held it up and he said, now, whose face is that? Caesar's, they said. Right, he said. You benefit from Caesar's Pax Romana, from the peacekeeping soldiers. You benefit from him by using his coin. Well, if you're happy to use his coins, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. He's referring to the tithes and offerings in Hebrew money, which they owed to God, and which many of them were avoiding paying. And he was throwing the challenge back. Are you giving the taxes to God that belongs to God with your shekels? Well, then give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar his money, his wages, which you're using, and give to God what is God's. And again, they had no answer to that one. So another group listening to him called Sadducees. Now, they were the liberal leaders of Jerusalem, and they couldn't believe in life after death. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And so I always say, that's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> and that's how you remember that name. Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. And so you can remember that a Pharisee was far I see. Look, looking ahead. That's just a little way to remember them. But the Sadducees were liberal. And they didn't believe in the supernatural side of scripture. They denied the miracles. And still today we have conservatives like Pharisees and Sadducees, liberals, when people read the Bible. So they denied the resurrection. And they came to Jesus with a problem. It wasn't a real problem. It was a thought up problem that was going to trap Jesus in his answer. And they referred to a practice called Levirat marriage. And the practice was started by Moses, that if there were a number of brothers and one of them married 
and the man died. Another brother had to take over the wife and raise up children for his name to preserve the line. It's an old Jewish custom, doesn't apply today, except in the really conservative Jews, and they do practice Levirant marriage. And their so-called problem was this. He said there were seven brothers in a family. First brother married, the man died, so the second brother took over the wife, and again died childless. And she went right through the seven brothers, was married seven times, all childless. Now they said, in the resurrection, which they didn't believe in, in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? As much as they now have set you a problem, you believe in the resurrection like the Pharisees do, then whose wife will she be? One of the most difficult questions I ever had was when my elder sister was dying of cancer. Her husband had died of cancer not long before. And the question my sister asked me was, will I soon be with my husband again? And I really got tied up in my answer. Because marriage is only for this world and only for life. When you vowed, as I did in my marriage, we vowed till death us do part. And uh, that's something that many husband and wives refuse to face when their partner dies. And so my sister's idea of heaven was, I'll be with my husband again. And in heaven we shall not be married. We shall be brother and sister with a lot of other brothers and sisters. But the marriage relationship only survives till one partner dies. And then the marriage has gone. And I remember fumbling an answer with my dear sister because I couldn't go along with what she was really asking about. She was longing to be with her husband again. But her marriage to him was over. And all our marriages will be over when one partner goes. And the vows we took no longer apply. And that was Jesus' reply to the Sadducees. You don't know your Bible well enough, he said. That should tell you. You will be like the angels. And the angels don't marry. And they don't die. And that will be your life in heaven. You will not be reunited as a married couple. And that needs to be thought about. We say it in a marriage service, but you know the things we say in a marriage service, when you think about them later and realize what you've promised, they're big vows for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. That's a big promise to make. Till death us do part. And you will no longer be held to that promise. That's why, for example, you are free to marry someone else as soon as your first partner dies. Not before, but as soon as one goes, the other is free from the marriage. And I remember a dear Baptist pastor that I knew, his wife died, and she, on her deathbed, told him who he should marry as soon as she'd gone. And I conducted their marriage just three or four months later, and a, a lovely couple, and the second couple were very happy indeed. Now why people should question me as they did 
for conducting a marriage so soon after the first wife had died. But I was happy to do that. He was free to remarry. And his first wife had actually told him, when I'm gone, you marry so-and-so. And uh, the lady he married was Spurgeon's granddaughter. Spurgeon was one of the greatest preachers in London um, years ago. And it was his granddaughter that we married to the Baptist pastor over in Guildford. So that's uh, something that we should think very honestly about. We take those vows till death us do part. And in heaven we are not reunited as married couples. We're one of a much larger family then, of brothers and sisters, no more. And so Jesus told the Sadducees, we'll be like the angels, we won't marry or be given in marriage, and we won't die. We will live forever but not as husband and wife. And then he turned it back on them by saying, have you never read in the book of Exodus that God, when he was introducing himself to Moses at the burning bush, said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He did not say, I was the God of your fathers, I was the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but I am. Because, said Jesus, those three are still alive. God is not the God of dead people, but of living people. He's the living God. And so, he's the God of my elder sister. He is her God. Not was, but is. I am is the name of God and that's present tense. I am. Not I was, but I am. And therefore, I once asked the Lord, what's the nearest English equivalent to your name in Hebrew? I wanted a word I could use when I spoke to him. And immediately to my mind came the word, always. God is always. He will always be your God. He is always your helper, always your fortress. It's a wonderful English equivalent. The Hebrew word is Yahweh. It's um, related to the verb to be. It's a participle of to be. And therefore it's usually translated in your Bible as I am. I am. And Jesus took that name and used it for himself. And every I am that Jesus said seven times was really saying I'm God. I am the bread of heaven. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And those first two words, which are doubly emphasized in the Greek New Testament, ego, I, me, are the words in Greek. And ego means I, from which we get egotism. I, and I, me, is I am. So that when Jesus said, I am, he was virtually saying, I, I am. Very prominent. And they took up stones to stone him to death when he said that. Because they recognized what he was claiming. I, I am. Only God has a right to say that. Anyway, that's by the way. So we turn from three things that other people said to him. And he now says three things to them. And this is all going on in the temple in his last week. 
So if you like, the three things we've talked about already, he is on the defense. But the best form of defense is attack. And so now he turns to the attack and he challenges other people. And the first one is he challenges them about their belief in the Messiah. They all believed as good Jews that one day God would send the Messiah to rescue them from their troubles. And many of them believed this would be a man and would be a direct descendant of David, the son of David, which he was. But he was more than that. And this is what he's challenging them about. He quotes Psalm 110, verse 1, which is more quoted in the New Testament than any other verse from the Old Testament. And that verse says, David speaking, says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until all your enemies are your footstool. Now he said, David calls the Messiah my Lord. Twice he uses the word Lord in that verse. The Lord, God, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until all your enemies are under your feet. And that was the practice in those days. When a king defeated another king, he insisted that the other king lay down on the ground and he then put his feet on him as a footstool. And some of the Egyptian monuments my wife and I saw when we went up the Nile, it portrayed the pharaoh sitting on a big throne and under his feet there were, there were images of all the kings they'd conquered. And here is God promising the Messiah, calling him Lord, and you can sit by me until all your enemies are down there under your feet. Now says Jesus, how can David call the Messiah my Lord if he's only a son of David? You don't get fathers talking to sons like that. If he's really saying, you're missing the point of that verse, and the point is that the Messiah whom God will send will be his son, as well as David's son. Now the teachers of the law recognized this was a very clever treatment of scripture and they flattered Jesus they said bravo well done you've given that your interpretation and you're right and Jesus responded to their flattery by insulting them it was an extraordinary thing to do remember where Jesus was when he did this and they'd flattered him and said that's a very clever argument you've used and there are no more questions from us. But he then said, beware of these teachers of law. And he gave them a, a terrible description. He said they are proud and they're greedy. The two worst sins in God's book are pride and greed. And he accuses them of both. He said they are proud. They love their status. They love walking around in their teaching robes. They love the chief seats in the synagogue. They love the seats of honor at banquets. They love being treated as top people. And then secondly, he said they're greedy. 
they take money from widows by promising to pray for them. That's a terrible thing. And so they were deliberately making money from the most vulnerable in society because a widow was really vulnerable. And so we come to the most famous story of all, the little gift put in by a widow into the temple treasury. Jesus was watching people who put their gifts into the temple treasury. And he was not asking how much their gift would buy, but how much it cost. And that tells you something about Jesus. He's not interested in big money. He is interested in sacrifice. And he said, that widow has put everything she has to live on in the temple treasury. And that's the biggest gift of today. He said, that's more than all the others have put in. And all the rich people have been pouring money in to the temple treasury. But he said, by comparison, she has put in more. And that tells you how he values money. He looks not at what it will buy, but what it costs to give. And the widow put in two mites, and together they would make up a farthing in English money. We don't have farthings now, but farthing was a quarter of a penny. And that was the equivalent of what she put in. And Jesus said that's more than all the others because that's all she has to live on. The famous preacher in London, in the London City Temple, which is on High Holborn, and he had preached on this. And a widow in his congregation came up after the sermon and gave him a, a big check. She was a wealthy widow. And she said, the widow's might, Dr. Parker. And Dr. Parker, the famous preacher, said to her, but the widow gave two mites. <laughs> and reluctantly she wrote out a second check for a large amount and gave it to him. And then he said, but madam, the widow gave everything she had. At which point she turned around and stamped her way out of the church. He was right to remind her that to use the term the widow's might was flippant unless you were giving everything you got. And I think it's rather lovely that that widow is known now all over the world because she was so generous. Now, as we've gone through this war of words, have you noticed that Jesus uses the Old Testament on a number of occasions? To him, that was scripture. And to him, that was the word of God. And if scripture said something, the Lord was saying it. And that's why he quoted Psalms 118 first and then Psalm 110. And if we follow Jesus, then we too take that same attitude to Scripture. It is God's Word. And behind all my Bible studies I'm sharing with you is my conviction that Scripture is God's Word. And that to quote it properly is to quote absolute truth. Makes a huge difference. I'm going to leave it there because next week we've got the most difficult chapter of Jesus' words where he unveils the future 
and predicts what is going to happen to his followers, to Jerusalem, the very capital he was in. And he literally spells out the future. We call that apocalyptic, which is a Greek word that means unveiling, pulling a curtain back to show people what they can't otherwise see. And the one thing we can't see is the future. But Jesus could. That's why he was called the prophet. And next week we look at chapter 21 and what he predicts is going to happen. And if you believe in Jesus, then you believe what he says about the future. That's going to be a very important study. But he's now spending his very last few days arguing with people. And the moral is, don't ever argue with the Lord. You're not going to win. He is too clever for you. And people have learned that to their cost. If you argue with God, you're going to lose the argument. And that's what we've learned from today. Good, you've been very patient. Thank you for listening.